the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch. Number 10. Transmission One day, the Master summoned his disciples Fa Hai, Chi Chang, Fa Ta, Shen Hui, Chi Chang, Chi Tong, Chi Chi, Chi Tao, Fa Chen, and Fa Ju, and said, You are different from other people. After my extinction, you should each become a master in a different region. I will now teach you how to preach the Dharma without losing the fundamental doctrine. First, you should discuss the three categories of the teaching and the 36 responses of active functioning. Coming out and going in transcend the two extremes. In preaching all the dharmas, do not depart from the self-nature. If suddenly someone asks you about the dharma, say something that will exhaust dichotomies. You should always use the teachings of the responses, such as the mutual causation of coming and going. The dualistic dharmas will be thoroughly eliminated, and the questioner will have no recourse or no place to go. The three categories of the teaching are the skandhas, realms, and entrances. Skandhas refers to the five skandhas of form, feeling, thoughts, impulses, and consciousness. Entrances refers to the twelve entrances, or ayatana, the six types of external sense data of forms, sounds, smells, tastes, tangibles, and dharmas, and the six internal sense organs of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Realms refers to the eighteen realms, the six types of sensory data, the six senses, and the six consciousnesses. The self-nature is able to incorporate the myriad dharmas and is named the storehouse consciousness. If one activates thinking, it is the transformation consciousness, the generation of the six consciousnesses to exit the six senses and see the six types of sensory data. Thus are the eighteen realms. All of them are functions that are activated from the self-nature. If the self-nature is false, it activates the eighteen falsely. If the self-nature is correct, it activates the eighteen correctly. If the functions are bad, then they are the functions of sentient beings. If they are good, then they are the functions of a Buddha. On what do the functions depend? They exist on the basis of the self-nature. The responses include the five insentient responses of the external realms the responses of heaven and earth, the response of sun and moon, the response of bright and dark, the response of yin and yang, and the response of water and fire. These are the five responses. There are twelve responses of the words of the characteristics of dharmas. The response of words and dharmas, the response of being and non-being, the response of form and formless, the response of with characteristics and without characteristics, the response of defiled and undefiled, the response of form and emptiness, the response of motion and stillness, the response of pure and impure, the response of ordinary and sage, the response of monk and layperson, the response of old and young, the response of large and small. These are the twelve responses. There are nineteen responses of functions activated from the self-nature. The response of long and short, the response of false and correct, the response of stupid and wise, the response of the foolish and sagacious, the response of disruption and concentration, the response of compassion and ill-will or poison, the response of morality and transgression, the response of straight and crooked, the response of real and empty, the response of steep and level, the response of the afflictions and bodhi, the response of permanent and impermanent, the response of commiseration and injury, the response of joy and anger, the response of generosity and stinginess, the response of advancement and regression, the response of generation and extinction, the response of the dharmakaya and the physical body, and the response of the Nirmanakaya and the Sambhogakaya. These are the nineteen responses. The Master said, If you understand 
how to use these 36 responses, you will be able to explain the teachings in all the sutras. Exiting and entering transcend the two extremes. The self-nature mobilizes the functions. When speaking with people, externally, you can transcend characteristics within characteristics, and internally, you can transcend emptiness within emptiness. Those who are entirely attached to characteristics will increase their false views. Those who are entirely attached to emptiness will increase their ignorance. Those who are attached to emptiness will slander the sutras. Just speak and do not use written words. Suppose you do not use written words. If there are also people to whom you should not speak, just say as follows, quote, This is the characteristic of written words. You may also say, quote, I simply speak, but do not posit written words. This is not to posit written words. They are also written words. Hearing someone preach, you may revile them, saying they are attached to written words. You should understand that you may be deluded yourselves and also revile the Buddha Sutras. You must not revile the Sutras, which is a transgression immeasurable. You may be attached to characteristics externally and teach that one should seek the truth. Or you may extensively establish training centers and preach about the errors of being and non-being. Such people will not be able to see the nature for eon after eon. Simply listen and cultivate according to the Dharma. Also, do not think about the hundred things and be impeded with regard to the enlightenment nature. If you listen to this explanation and do not cultivate, you will, on the contrary, generate false thoughts. Just cultivate according to the Dharma, bequeathing the Dharma without abiding in characteristics. If all of you would be enlightened, rely on this for your preaching. Rely on this for your functioning. Rely on this for your practice. Rely on this for all your actions. You would not lose the fundamental doctrine. When people inquire about the doctrines, when they ask of being, respond with non-being. When they ask of non-being, respond with being. When they ask of the ordinary, respond with the sagely. When they ask of the sagely, respond with the ordinary. Through the two modes of speaking, you will generate the doctrine of the middle. Respond to them, one by one, and if there are any other questions, make up your response according to this, and you will not go wrong. If someone asks you, what is darkness? You should answer, brightness is the cause and darkness is the condition. When brightness disappears, there is darkness. Brightness reveals darkness, and darkness reveals brightness. Through the modes of coming and going, you will create the doctrine of the middle. All other questions should be handled like this. Later, when you transmit the Dharma, you may rely on this to develop material for teaching. Don't lose the central doctrine. In the seventh month of the first year of the Tai Chi, or Great Ultimate Period, the 49th Hexagenary Year, the Yen Ho, or Extended Peace Year, or 712, the Master ordered his followers to go to Kuo Yen Su in Xin Chao to construct a stupa. He had them hurry the work, and the unveiling was at the end of the summer the following year. On the first day of the seventh month of 713, he assembled his followers and said, I will depart from this world in the eighth month. If any of you have doubts, you should ask me about them soon, and I will resolve your doubts for you and make your delusions disappear. After I am gone, there will be no one to teach you. Fahai and the others listened, and everyone wept. Only Shen Hui was emotionally unmoved and did not cry. The master said, Young Master Shen Hui, you have become able to be unmoved before good and bad, before praise and blame, without generating sorrow and joy. You others have not attained this. What way can you have been cultivating all these years on this mountain? 
Who is it you're crying for so sadly now? If you're sorry for me, you don't know where I'm going. I know myself where I'm going. If I didn't know where I was going, I wouldn't be announcing it to you in advance. You're all crying because you don't know where I'm going. If you knew where I was going, then you wouldn't be crying. The Dharma nature is fundamentally without generation and extinction, going and coming. You should all sit down and I will recite a verse for you. It is called the verse of the true and provisional and motion and stillness. You should recite this verse with the same meaning as mine. You should cultivate according to this without losing the central doctrine. The assembly of monks bowed and requested that the master recite the verse. The verse went, All things are without any truth. Do not see them as true. If you see the true, this is for what you see to be completely untrue. If you are able to possess the true yourself, transcend the provisional and your mind will be true. If you do not transcend the provisional in your own mind, you will be without the true, for where could the true be located? If you are sentient, then you are able to move. That which is insentient is immobile. If you cultivate the practice of motionlessness, you become identical to the immobility of insentiency. If you are seeking the true motionlessness, then realize that there is a motionlessness of motion. Motionlessness is motionlessness. Insentient objects lack the seeds of Buddhahood. If you are able to discriminate well characteristics, the cardinal meaning of Buddhism is motionlessness. Just to have such a view is to have functioning that is such-like. I am telling you, students, make an effort and be careful. Do not in this gateway of the Mahayana grasp onto the wisdom of birth and death. If you can correspond to the truth upon hearing these words, then we may discuss the doctrines of the Buddha together. If you in fact do not achieve correspondence, then hold your palms together in the Anjali Mudra and be joyful that you've encountered the teaching at all. This teaching is fundamentally without disputation, for disputation leads only to errors. To grasp and oppose and dispute the teaching is for one's nature to enter into birth and death. After the assembly heard Huang Neng speak this verse, they all did obeisance. Everyone there understood the master's point, and they all composed their minds and became determined to cultivate in reliance on the Dharma without any further disputation. Realizing that great master Huang Neng would not remain in the world for long, the elder Fa Hai bowed once more and asked, after your reverence has entered nirvana, to whom will the robe and dharma be bequeathed? The master said, There is a summary and circulation of my sermon at Tafansu and my teachings up to now, entitled Platform Sutra of the Dharma Treasure. You should all protect this text and transmit it. In your saving of the myriad living beings, you should rely on only these sermons. This is called the correct dharma. I have preached the dharma for you now, but I will not bequeath the robe. This is because your roots of faith are mature. You are definitely without doubt, and you are able to undertake the great affair. In accordance with the intention of the former patriarch, great master Bodhidharma, in the bequest of his final verse, the robe should not be transmitted. His verse went, I originally came to this land to transmit the Dharma and save deluded sentient beings. A single flower opens into five leaves, and the fruit will appear of itself. The Master said further, Good friends, you have each purified your minds and listened to me preach the Dharma. If you wish to achieve the planting of the roots of wisdom, you must master the samadhi of the single characteristic and the samadhi of the single practice. If in all locations you do not reside in characteristics, if within those characteristics you do not generate revulsion or attraction and are also without grasping or rejecting, 
If you do not think about matters such as the creation and destruction of personal benefit, and if you are relaxed and quiet and emptily melded with the palate and simple, this is called the samadhi of the single characteristic. If in all your walking, standing still, sitting and lying down, you have a pure and unified straightforward mind, not moving from the place of enlightenment, truly creating a pure land, this is called the samadhi of the single practice. Those who accomplish both samadhis are like the earth bearing seeds, which it stores and nourishes during their maturation into fruit. So is it with the samadhis of the single characteristic and single practice. My preaching the Dharma to you now is like the timely rains that moisten the great earth, and your Buddha natures are likened to the seeds. Encountering this watering, your Buddha natures will all begin to grow. Those who partake of my meaning will definitely attain Bodhi. Those who rely upon my practice will certainly realize the wondrous fruit. Listen to my verse, which says, The mind ground stores the various seeds, which all sprout through the universal rain. With the flower of sudden enlightenment, intelligence is ended, and the fruit of Bodhi forms of itself. After the Master spoke this verse, he said, The Dharma is non-dual, and the mind is likewise. The way, or Tao, enlightenment is pure and without the various characteristics. You should all be careful not to contemplate purity or make the mind empty. The mind is pure and cannot be grasped or rejected. You should all make an effort. Go well according to your needs. The members of the congregation then bowed and dispersed. On the eighth day of the seventh month, Great Master Hui Ning suddenly addressed his followers, saying, I am going to return to Jin Chao. Get a boat ready, quickly. The large congregation then cried out, trying their best to get him to stay. The Master said, The appearance of the Buddhas is like their manifestation of Nirvana. Where there is coming, there must be going. This is an everlasting rule. There must be some location to which this skeletal form will revert. The congregation said, When you leave here, how soon will you return? The master said, Leaves fall and revert to roots. I cannot say when I will return. They asked further, To whom has the storehouse of the eye of the correct dharma been transmitted? The master said, those who are enlightened have attained it. Those who are without mind have penetrated it. They asked again, Won't there be some difficulties in the future? The master said, Five or six years after my nirvana, a person will come to take my head. Listen to my prediction. On the head, cultivating intimacy. In the mouth, a need for repast. Encountering the difficulty of sufficiency, with willows, the officials. Huaynang also said, Seventy years after I go, two bodhisattvas will come from the east, one a monk and one a layman. They will simultaneously establish my teaching and make it flourish, decorating the monasteries and making many transmissions. The members of the congregation asked, we do not know through what generations the transmission has proceeded from the appearance of the Buddhas and patriarchs of the past. Please reveal this to us. The Master said, The ancient Buddhas have responded to the world in numbers unmeasurable and beyond calculation. For the moment, however, we take seven Buddhas as the beginning. Vipassian Buddha, Sikhian Buddha, and Visvapu Buddha of the ornamentation eon of the past. And Krakyuchanda Buddha, Kanakamuni Buddha, Kasyapa Buddha, and Sakyamuni Buddha of the present auspicious eon. These are the seven Buddhas. Taking Sakyamuni Buddha as the first of these seven Buddhas, the transmission is as follows. Number one, the honored one, Mahakasyapa. Number two, 
the Honored One, Ananda. Number three, the Honored One, Sanavasa. Number four, the Honored One, Upagupta. Number five, the Honored One, Diktika. Number six, the Honored One, Misraka. Number seven, the Honored One, Vasumitra. Number eight, the Honored One, Buddha Nandi. Number nine, the Honored One, Buddha Mitra. Number ten, the Honored One, Parsva. Number eleven, the Honored One, Punya Yasas. Number twelve, the Honored One, Asvagosa. Number thirteen, the Honored One, Kapimala. Number fourteen, the Honored One, Nagarjuna. Number fifteen, the Honored One, Kanadiva. Number sixteen, the Honored One, Rahulata. Number seventeen, the Honored One, Samganandi. Number eighteen, the Honored One, Gayasatta. Number nineteen, the Honored One, Kumaralatta. Number twenty, the Honored One, Jayata. Number twenty-one, the Honored One, Vasubandhu. Number twenty-two, the Honored One, Manoratita. Number twenty-three, the Honored One, Halanayasas. Number twenty-four, the Honored One, Simhabikshu. Number twenty-five, the Honored One, Vasista. Number twenty-six, the Honored One, Punyamitra. Number twenty-seven, the Honored One, Prajnatara. Number twenty-eight, the Honored One, Venerable Bodhidharma, the initial patriarch in this land. Number twenty-nine, Great Master Hui Ko. Number thirty, Great Master Seng Tsan. Number thirty-one, Great Master Tao Sin. And number thirty-two, Great Master Hong Zhen. I, Hui Neng, am the thirty-third patriarch. From the beginning, the patriarchs have each had successors. In the future, when it comes to letting the transmission be carried onward, you must not make mistakes. Great Master Huai Neng, after a vegetarian feast at Kuo An Su in Sin Chao on the initial third day of the eighth month of the fiftieth hexagenary year, the second year of the Sen Tian period, or 713, addressed his followers. All of you, sit according to your stations. I am going to part from you. Vahai addressed him. Your reverence, what teaching is it you leave so that the deluded people of later times will be able to see the Buddha nature? The master said, All of you, listen well. If the deluded people of some later time recognize sentient beings, they will recognize them as the Buddha nature. If they do not recognize sentient beings, they would seek the Buddha for ten thousand eons without ever meeting him. I teach you now, to recognize the sentient being in one's own mind is to see the Buddha nature in one's own mind. If you wish to see the Buddha, just recognize the sentient being in your mind. It is only sentient beings who are deluded as to the Buddha. The Buddhas are not deluded about sentient beings. If you are enlightened to your self-nature, then the sentient being is the Buddha. If you are deluded as to the self-nature, then what might be a Buddha is only a sentient being. If the self-nature is universally same, that is, level, the sentient being is a Buddha. If the self-nature is false and steep, the Buddha is a sentient being. If your minds are steep and crooked, then the Buddha is hidden within the sentient being. If a single moment of thought is level and direct, then the sentient being becomes a Buddha. One's own mind possesses the Buddha, and this own Buddha is the true Buddha. If one is without the Buddha mind oneself, where could one seek the true Buddha? Your own minds are the Buddha. Do not doubt this. Outside of this there is not a single thing that can be 
posited, all of us generate the 10,000 types of dharmas from our fundamental minds. Therefore, the sutra says, quote, when the mind is generated, the various types of dharmas are generated. When the mind is extinguished, the various types of dharmas are extinguished. Close quote. I will now leave a verse for you in parting, called the verse of the true Buddha of the self-nature. If people of later times understand the point of this verse, they will see their own fundamental minds and achieve the enlightenment of Buddhahood. The verse goes, The such-like self-nature is the true Buddha. False views and the three poisons are King Mara. During false delusion, Mara is in one's home. During correct views, the Buddha is in one's hall. When false views and the three poisons are generated in the nature, this is for King Mara to come reside in one's home. When with correct views one eradicates the three poisonous states of mind, Mara is transformed into the Buddha, true and not provisional. The Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya, the three bodies, are fundamentally a single body. If one can see it oneself within the nature, this is the cause of Bodhi and the achievement of Buddhahood. From the Nirmanakaya is fundamentally generated the pure nature. The pure nature is always within the Nirmanakaya. The nature makes the Nirmanakaya practice the correct Eightfold Path and in the future will be perfect and complete, true without limit. The licentious nature is fundamentally a cause within the pure nature. To eliminate the licentious results in the body of the pure nature. Within the nature, you should all transcend the five desires. In the instant that you see the nature, they are true. If you have encountered the sudden teaching in this lifetime, become enlightened immediately to the self-nature and see the world-honored one. If you cultivate by trying to become a Buddha, you'll never know where to seek for the true. If you are able to see the true in your own mind, having the true will be the cause of your achieving Buddhahood. If you do not see the self-nature, but seek the Buddha externally, every activation of your mind will be that of a big fool. This sudden teaching is being left for you now. But you must cultivate it yourself in order to save others. I tell you, future students of the way, if your view is not like this, you will come to great sorrow. After the master spoke this verse, he announced, You may all stay here, but after my nirvana, do not become upset and cry tears like rain. Those who accept condolences from others or wear mourning clothes are not my disciples and are not following the correct dharma. Just recognize your own fundamental minds and see your own fundamental natures, which are neither moving nor still, neither generated nor extinguished, neither going nor coming, neither correct nor false, neither abiding nor going. I am afraid your minds are deluded and you don't understand my meaning. I will tell you again in order to make you see your natures. After my nirvana, practice in accordance with this, just as if I were alive. If you go against my teaching, it would be no use, even if I were alive. I will say another verse. Stupefied, not cultivating good. Leaping, not creating evil, serene, eradicating knowledge, vast, the mind unattached. When the master finished saying this verse, he sat upright until the third watch of the night. Suddenly he announced to his followers, I am going, and peacefully he went. At the time, a strange fragrance filled the room. A white rainbow touched the earth. Trees in the forest changed to white, and the birds and animals cried out. 
In the eleventh month, the officials of the three prefectures, Quang Chao, Xiao Chao, and Xin Chao, the monks and the lay people, argued over who was to receive the master's body. Since they could not decide, they burned incense to gain the portent, saying, The smoke from the incense will indicate the directions in which the master's body should return. The smoke from the incense connected directly to Zhao Qi. On the thirteenth day of the eleventh month, the master's casket and the robe and bowl he had transmitted were returned to Zhao Qi. In the seventh month of the next year, the casket was opened, and the disciple Fang Pian spread incense paste on the master's remains. Remembering the prediction about taking of the head, they lacquered the master's neck with metal sheets and placed it in his stupa. Suddenly, a white light appeared from inside the stupa that went straight up to heaven. Three days later, it began to dissipate. The prefect of Xiao Chao memorialized about these happenings, and an edict was promulgated for the establishment of a style, recording the master's spiritual activities. The master was seventy-six. He received the transmission of the robe at age twenty-four, and offered up his hair to become a monk at age thirty-nine. He preached the Dharma to benefit sentient beings for thirty-seven years and transmitted the Dharma to forty-three people. The number who became enlightened and transcended the state of unenlightened ordinary person cannot be known. The robe that was transmitted by Bodhidharma as an emblem of the faith which was of Chu Swan cotton from the western region, a precious bowl of polished manava given by Emperor Chung Tsung, the image of the master sculpted by Fang Pian, and his religious implements are stored forever at the training center at Pao Lin Su. This platform sutra has been transmitted in order to make manifest the central doctrine, to disseminate the triple treasure, and to benefit all living beings. End of the Platform Sutra of the Dharma Treasure of the Great Master, the Sixth Patriarch. After the year 1979, under the wishes of Master Foi Wan and Zhao Pu Chu, Zi Zong Zun ordered the restoration of Hui Neng's physical body. Hui Neng, the sixth patriarch of Chan Buddhism, 638 to 713.